That's it. Uh, cool. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to the St Andrews Debating Society, the oldest and some might say finest of its kind. Uh, this is not the usual debate format. Instead, today we're doing a panel discussion. You can probably tell because we have a panel. Uh, I would introduce my panelists, but I think it's actually probably best if they introduce themselves so that they can give their own kind of uh, description of their interest in the particular uh, conflict. This is a panel discussion on Ukraine. I'm assuming that everyone's aware of that. Um, so, fantastic. If we would like to start with Dr. Luke Miller. Hi, I'm Dr. Luke Miller. I am coordinator of the Strategic Studies and Lit here at the University of St Andrews. My specialism is in UK and US foreign and defence policy, but basically ask me anything about war and things that go boom and I'll give you a reasonable facsimile of an answer. And I'm really looking forward to tonight's event. Uh, I'm Dom, it's just Dom. Um, I was born in Hungary, so that's partly why um, I'm connected um, to Ukraine. And I worked in the House of Commons here in the UK, working on foreign policy issues, and many of them are connected to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, and to Ukraine. And I'm Hussein Aliyev, I'm a lecturer in Central and Eastern European Studies at the University of Glasgow, and uh, since 2015 my research has been mostly on Ukraine. Uh, I was uh, examining why individuals uh, volunteer to participate in uh, armed conflict in the Donbass war, and uh, also have family in Ukraine, so yeah, lots of connection to Ukraine. Okay, uh, my name is Rick Fawn, uh, I've been here uh, I was appointed young, but I've been here a very long time at St. Andrews in International Relations. And perhaps by way of background, I might uh, uh, be presumptuous and say, in a way, I was born uh, in Ukraine. Um, a second Ukraine, that is Canada, where we have uh, an enormous uh, population descendant of Ukrainians. And I say that because it meant that I grew up knowing about Ukrainian identity and knowing that we had funded university chairs for the study of the Ukrainian people which underlines all the more the both mendacious and imbecilic official claims by the Russian government about the non-existence of the Ukrainians. And while my work, both in terms of academic and policy, has stretched a call across the post-communist space, um, there have been a number of connections uh, to Ukraine, including when I was young, uh, traveling there, and a number of other republics within the Soviet Union in the summer of 1991, and, and realizing then that I actually wanted to spend more time in Ukraine. It was very, very captivating. Uh, and I got different opportunities in succeeding years. And that included, uh, we were speaking about the Soros Foundation initiatives <coughs> in the post-communist space. And in one of those streams, I worked with Donetsk University, which would end up being uh, uh, obliterated. And we used to meet in Crimea. And uh, I've, I've been to the west of Ukraine, all across to the east. I saw the Zaporozhye uh, nuclear power plant many years ago, and I'll confess now that I couldn't imagine that anybody would think to howitzer it. Um, so in very, very many ways, there's, um, there's a very deep personal connection to this. A lot of Ukrainians whom I know, many of whom have been very directly and deeply affected by this. But it's also intrinsically part of a, a large and ongoing research program, and that research program in many ways started in the late 1990s and coincides A, with the rise of somebody called Putin, and B, when I had the opportunity to go into a Russian-backed separatist zone um, of Abkhazia. So thank you for letting me say perhaps more than I should as, as a way of introduction. My name is Tom Kamuzel. I teach in the School of History and my remit is Central and Eastern Europe uh, in the modern period. However, the lens through which I'm having a look at this region is the too rarely, too rarely uh, neglected lens of language politics. Uh, and language politics uh, is the basis of politics uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and nowadays as we can see in Putin's Russia language uh, got accepted as the basis of this Russian neo-imperialism and many students in the West uh, do not uh, get it truly speaking that uh, language makes nation in this region of Central and Eastern Europe uh, and uh, legitimizes uh, 
politics, uh, which is the norm of doing politics over there. And it uh, has taken me a decade and more <laughs> to try to explain it to my uh, student and make my uh, colleagues, uh, my historian colleagues, more aware of the specificity uh, of this region and the dynamics of politics there. And uh, just recently, like uh, two months ago, uh, my my work, uh, the um, Atlas uh, of Language Politics uh, in Modern Central Europe, which is open access, uh, kind of explicates it through uh, 40 maps, so it may be helpful for uh, some of you to have a look at it. So uh, just before we begin, I just want to thank all the <coughs> panelists for being here. Um, it's great to have such a kind of wide range of expertise in the area. Um, and so also just to explain to everyone uh, the kind of brief overview of how this is going to work. I think I'm going to ask some sort of very general questions. We'll kind of get into a bit of a discussion on the panel um, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor so that you guys can all get involved as well. Uh, so starting off, I'm going to ask an incredibly broad and potentially obvious question. Um, if any panellists want to answer, just jump in when you have something to say. Um, but starting off, I just want to put it into perspective. So who are the kind of key actors in this war? I can ask a specific person. <laughs> it can be more conducive. Uh, Dom, would you like to start? <laughs> nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, key actors in the war? Yeah. Well, in, on, on the one hand, you obviously have, and of course I'm probably, no, absolutely certainly the least knowledgeable on, on, the, on the general and strategic side of the, of the matter. Um, but of course you have um, the Russian dictator's troops, um, partly conscript, although that was denied up until very recently and partly it's um, paratroopers and special forces who started the invasion. And on the other side you have the Ukrainians with their great um, resistance to, to, to horrible oppression. Um, and of course then you have the regional and the international dynamics, Ukraine borders NATO countries, um, my, my own included, and, um, and, and those dynamics, how NATO reacts and how the West reacts, I think are as important as, as the actual armed conflict going on on the ground. May I jump on that? Uh, I would add uh, on the part of Russia also Belarus, which should not be forgotten, because uh, Belarusian territory is being used by the Russian troops and uh, Belarusian infrastructure is being used uh, by the Russian army. And actually, the legitimate uh, government uh, of Belarus, which nowadays is based in Vilnius, is calling the international community to recognize the fact that the fact of Belarus is occupied effectively by Russia. Um, Dr. Levy, you're an expert in the paramilitary groups. Uh, I would uh, probably uh, I would talk about paramilitary groups um, probably at a later moment, but I will add that there are also these breakaway republics that are part of the conflict is Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, so they've certainly been uh, probably used and abused by Russia as a reason to start uh, this invasion. Okay, I, I might oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I might be contentious by suggesting that uh, actors include history and nuclear deterrence, um, and on these we need to elaborate, but um, history is on the present, and history is of course very subjective and extremely powerful. And I think when we start to speak about practical considerations, something that we will hit up against immediately is nuclear deterrence, and the fact that we cannot on that basis, or indirectly on that basis, for example, have a no-fly zone over Ukraine, and that Russia has a military permissiveness that few other countries would be able to get away with in these circumstances. And we have that contrast because we saw how Western countries slash NATO acted, for example, in and against Libya, in and against Bosnia. So those are actors, I think, as well. So just to, to pick up on a point Don was making in terms of describing the balance of forces between the two states, and I think actually it's worth taking a step back. This is the first convention, fully conventional war involving air, land and sea combat that has been fought in Europe 
arm between two between two internationally recognised states since the end of the, since the end of the Second World War. Now, I much prefer studying wars that have already happened to trying to understand one that is currently taking place because war is always marked by the intentional infliction of death, pain and suffering by one group of people on another group of people. Now, just to, to pick up on Dom's point about the, the balance of forces between the two sides, what I think is important to acknowledge is that although this is an invasion of Ukraine, it was not planned as an invasion. It was planned as an occupation. The idea was, or the idea I think behind what Putin has done, would have been to quickly occupy Ukraine by decapitating its government, by decapitating its government using precision airstrikes and precision guided munitions and it's clear from the the composition of the initial Russian force that's gone into Ukraine in terms of which units are at the front lines of that, that what they expected to be dealing with was civil disobedience and protest and perhaps an insurgency. This was not a force balanced to fight a conventional war. So often the paratroopers that Dom is referring to, they, they have often been used in Russia and in this, uh, the CIS, the ex-Soviet space, as um, shock troops, as sort of aid to a civil power, as sort of aid to the, the police. There's also, if you look at the casualty reports that are filtering back, you see a lot of um, Russian National Guard units um, that have been, that have suffered very heavy casualties and those are designed really as armed police, as essentially SWAT teams on a large scale, an armed, an armed gendarmerie effectively. Um, <coughs> so one of the things that's become I think apparent to me at any rate, and I may be proved wrong by history, is that this was not planned as an invasion and Putin certainly did not expect to be fighting in conflict. He is fighting. <coughs> Excuse me. Now on the other hand, you have a Ukrainian army that has been extensively trained and re-equipped by, re-equipped, at least in regards of its personal weapons, by NATO since 2014. You also have a massive um, territorial defence force, i.e. reservists, who are civilians who have been called to the colours. Now that, that suggests that um, if this conflict drags on, there's going to be a decision that NATO is going to have, have to make about the level of equipment that it is willing to supply to Ukraine on an ongoing basis. Currently at the moment we have one of the biggest transfers of conventional arms undertaken in history. But if this conflict continues, there are going to be questions about supplying Ukraine with more weapons and with heavier weapons. So we've already had the discussion about supplying Ukraine with MiG-29. If the war drags on, particularly if there is more fighting in urban centres like Kyiv, like Kharkiv, like Cherniv, uh, you're going to have a discussion about um, you're going to have a discussion about supplying Ukraine with artillery. You're going to have a discussion about supplying Ukraine with tanks. You're going to have to have a discussion about supplying Ukraine with infantry fighting vehicles. One of the things that's got slightly overlooked in all the discussion about all the anti-tank and anti-aircraft uh, missiles that have been supplied to Ukraine is that one of the things the Americans are supplying is about 20 million rounds of small arms ammunition. That is bullets, that is grenades. That is mortars. Now that is a good start from a Ukrainian point of view, but you are going to need much, much more of that type of equipment. Sorry if that went on a little bit long. No, no, thank you very much. Um, just, uh, I think before we get into the sort of 
specifics about the military aspect of this. I just wanted to pick up on what Professor Fawn said about the history of the conflict, because I think that is something that is incredibly crucial to talk about. And I was wondering if someone wanted to offer, um, how is the history and the different perceptions of the Russian-Ukrainian relationship in history influencing the way that the conflict is playing out now? I'm sure we'd all have many things to say, so it, it's it's slightly uh, presumptuous to come in. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, because you raised yeah. it, would you like yeah. to? Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure we, we have to be familiar with aspects of this. So it is it is a foundational piece of this. It is a motivational. It's a justificational aspect of the Russian regime's actions, um, based on falsehood, uh, based on denial of existence. I mean, it's extremely pernicious. Um, And in so doing, it's also an upending of conventional understandings of the Soviet system. So in one fell swoop, it seems to me that Putin has uh, undone any any feeling, let alone allegiance, to the Soviet system, to the principles on which it was made, and its understandings of national identities. So in his his speech, he took on some of the, the features of a a history that I think is still iconic, still valuable to a lot of Russians. He's kicked away some of the pillars of the people who would be supporting him. Uh, In terms of, I mean, I'm sure we all have a a great deal to say on this, but a second and final point for now would be uh, what I'm sure we've all seen, and that is the galvanization of the Ukrainians. So we have the on, on a number of levels, the reverse effect of what presumably Moscow would have intended. And on this level, that is to really galvanize the Ukrainians into nationhood. We tend to think, I defer to people who, who know these things far more intimately than I do, but we tend to think about nations being forged in war. Uh, there, there is an element of that collective action, indeed the violence, that that uh, helps to create in terms of national identity. Um, Ukraine has been described in many different ways. There are probably many here who could speak to that, many here who could speak to that. But probably the key factor is that of a country with various episodes of history, various different inputs. I mean, of course, Ukraine, this would be part of the the Putinesque narrative. Ukraine doesn't exist because it was actually hived off to other places and grew up in other places. And when we came to have a Ukraine, it was because appendages, not that he says it, but a kind of Frankenstein's monster is created because pieces that don't belong together have been arbitrarily sewn together to create this thing. But put that aside, what we have most definitively is a Ukrainian nation. And that is probably one of the the most important, one of the strongest things to come out of this, irrespective of the conclusion, some of which might be quite ghoulish, that we come to here. There is a Ukrainian nation. There was always a Ukrainian nation in the diaspora, and that's something that I think Moscow has very, very stupidly ignored. But there is, despite all the challenges, and Ukraine has had multitudes of challenges over the past 30 years, there is a Ukrainian nation. And that is probably the longest and biggest obstacle for whatever official Russia intends to do in decades to come. If I may to add on that. I'm in fear now. (coughs) Uh, It is not history which is kind of fueling or justifying the conflict. It is the use of history. So the politics of history, or Germans call Geschichtspolitik, beginning in the 1980s, Putin and his regime are treating history as a kind of a smorgasbord. You are taking this bit, another bit, and so on. However, they take the bits which feed into symbolism, which is being uh, uh, projected by the controlled Russian media in order to galvanize, mobilize the Russian population around quote unquote the cause. What is the cause? The cause, as Putin kind of said, is rebuilding the uh, Soviet Union. But obviously, 
from the acts and from the symbols he is choosing. He is choosing some symbols which are feeding, uh, which are taken from the Soviet history, like quote unquote the Great Patriotic War, so meaning this leg of the Second World War after the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, fell apart in 1941. And uh, the war was being prepared, we know now, in 2021, last year. And it was most probably deferred only to the, uh, due to the Olympics in Beijing. Because 2021 was the highly celebrated 80th uh, anniversary of the start of the G Great Patriotic War, which kind of mobilized the population for the effort. It was all the time on TV uh, news. There is another symbolism which kind of is forgotten here in the West, but in 1721 the Russian Empire was proclaimed by Peter the Great after winning uh, the Great Northern War. So it is 200 years afterward, and why not to have an empire again? And when it comes to the denial of the existence of uh, the Ukrainian nation, it is basically repeating the 1833 Count Uvarov's 1833 uh, ideological slogan that Russia is, the Russian Empire is orthodoxy, autocracy and narodnost, nationality which you could translate as a language. And this kind of ideology, for instance, uh, came to the fore in 1864 or 3, when uh, the decree was issued that the Ukrainian language, well, in Russian it was referred as little the Russian language, never existed, doesn't exist, and cannot exist. Yeah? So I, I, I would say we are witnessing uh, repackaging uh, of some Soviet elements, but mostly uh, imperial elements as a kind of a new, uh, a new imperial Russian ideology, uh, which uh, we, which is being deployed for not only rebuilding the Russian Empire but broadening it. Because we should not be forgetting that the Russian Federation itself is an empire which has not uh, undergone the, the process of decolonization yet. So just picking up on that then, is that the main goal behind this, this kind of idea of Russian Empire? Is this kind of what Putin's looking for, is that? Well, if you are asking me, I, 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 I could say yes, because he he's all the time in his rhetoric saying that Russia will be great again, that Russia will raise from its knees and it will extend at least to the borders which the Soviet Union used to have, and even better, it should extend to the borders uh, of uh, what the Russian Empire was before the First World War, and maybe before 1864, meaning including Alaska. And uh, this is kind of advertised beginning in, uh, with 2007 with uh, the Russian slogan and the Russian organization, foundation, Ruski Mir which is translated into English as the Russian world, but it can also be translated into English as Russian peace. So, uh, Pax Rosica, uh, if, you, if you want. And uh, f from, the, fr from the recent, uh, last week, uh, noises which we get from the Kremlin, especially the article by Medvedev, he, he said that Poland should be next, yeah? So Poland was not part of the Soviet Union. So it, it, it is getting ugly and you are getting a lot uh, of these kind of pointers. Uh, that the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. So Russian usage of media seems to be quite important in both conducting the views of Russians, but also in the way that they're using international media. I was wondering if anyone had any kind of insight in that. 
Uh, yeah, it's probably talking about the media propaganda. We have to look back 20 years when uh, Putin basically came to power, and that's when this propaganda machine started to, to get developed. And to, over the years, it became more and more extreme, and the narratives became more and more separated from reality. And uh, uh, now we have a complete uh, uh, blockade of, of any sort of uh, independent media in Russia. That's uh, uh, basically with there were just a handful of independent media sources which were shut down after the first week of the war and uh, currently uh, Kremlin has absolute control over this propaganda machine which has been quite efficient into brainwashing millions of Russians and uh, th there are some surveys that come out out of Russia now not very reliable because obviously conducted by pro-Kremlin organizations but there also uh, there's been a number of public polls conducted by relatively independent bloggers in Russia and they all indicate that uh, the majority of Russians still support President Putin and they still support the war effort exclusively because of this continuous brainwashing uh, that they've been subjected to for almost uh, 20 years. And probably on this we can, uh, you, you, we can add about uh, neo-imperialism because in the way we would think uh, the, the cost of living is uh, going up you cannot uh, have uh, the uh, simple things of life which you think are the norm, then you change the government and you have another government which would provide it. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in Russia it appears that uh, having imbibed uh, on this ideology of neo-imperialism called Ruski Mir, many people uh, are fine uh, to suffer the indignities uh, of shortages uh, and uh, the limited uh, chances of life in order to see the country being great again. It sounds almost Trump, but that's uh, uh, how, how it works. And the country being great again, it is uh, a function of other countries being afraid of uh, this kind of resurgent uh, Russia. Yes, just, just other than that, I think what we need to keep in mind in the West is that Russia is doing two things when it comes to propaganda. First, it has actual propaganda as we understand it in Russia itself, the goal of which is to persuade the Russian people that what is happening is denazification, is a special operation and all the rest of it. But they're doing something much more interesting, cruel and terrible outside of Russia and that is the misinformation and disinformation campaign, which is really hard to tackle. And the reason why is that the Russians outside of Russia don't want you to believe them. The goal when it comes to misinformation is not you guys to believe what the Russians are saying. Their, their goal is for you not to believe other sources either. To start questioning the BBC, to start questioning CNN, to start questioning your own media and to be a bit confused as to who is responsible as to what is happening. And I think when this became very clear was when the separatists shot down um, that um, passenger plane um, and then of course first of all you, you had videos when this was this was shown as a great thing because they thought that they were Ukrainian warplanes. And then when it turned out that it was passengers dead on the ground, this kicked in. And what could you see is that different and completely contradictory messages came out of Russia today and came out of Sputnik. They changed um, Wikipedia to a certain extent to make it look like that Ukrainian planes could fly as high as they actually cannot. So it's a huge operation, the goal of which is to have the West confused. And that is, I think, something is very hard to tackle, and we have not really found a way to do so. Banning Russia today and getting Sputnik of, the, of, of televisions is, is a good start, but what, what happens after, you know, after when, when this very direct action disappears? And um, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Actually, I'd, I'd like to ask Dom and the rest of the panel a uh, question in that regard. Ukrainian information operations, Ukrainian propaganda, for want of a better word, has been, ex has been extremely effective, at least in appealing to a European um, Western audience. I think there's some evidence to suggest it's much less effective outside, outside of that space. But I just wondered if you wanted to talk about the way in which President Zelensky and those around, because, you know, famously, President Zelensky is an actor 
a comedian, and he ran his own television production co production company prior to becoming president. And one of the things that I think has been really interesting uh, watching this conflict from the outside is the way in which Zelensky, as a deeply controversial figure in Ukraine, and not a and not a particularly popular president, you know, before the invasion, his approval rating was about twenty was about twenty percent or so. But actually, having a television produ production company running a country during a war might actually, at least in information terms, is actually pretty effective. So I wondered if Dom and the rest of the panel <coughs> wanted to speak to that. Well, just, just very quickly to, to, to reflect on that, I, I totally agree, I mean what Ukraine is doing is, is the same thing, they are putting out propaganda and from a political background or, or seeing that work in, in Western societies, it is one of the most effective um, political campaigns that I've seen, um, exactly because he has, he has a history and he knows how to do it. Um, and of course, sometimes war can be used to, to make leaders stronger, and that is what Putin wants in his own country. But in a, in a way, that is what's happening in Ukraine. And of course, I am personally very biased. I mean, looking at the terrible things that is happening to the Ukrainians, and then I, I have a lot of feelings for the Ukrainian people and for President Zelensky. So um, I think I'm biased as to, as to sometimes understanding that this is propaganda the same way. The, the, the Russian would be. So I just wanted to sort of pick up on that. Um, how how influential is Zelensky in leading the kind of Ukrainian movement? Then is is he the kind of figurehead, or are there kind of other things and people and groups that are kind of playing into this behind the scenes? Well, he's certainly, um, as, as mentioned before, he wasn't as popular before the war, so his uh, rate, approval ratings were dropping and uh, there was a lot of infighting within the Ukrainian political system before the war. For example, the former president, Petr Poroshenko, he was under investigation by, by the ruling party, a servant of the people, Zelensky's party, but he certainly uh, skyrocketed to popularity after uh, the war has started and the way he, he handled uh, these first days of the war, uh, the, the way that he decided to stay in Kiev and not to grab that opportunity to leave the capital when he was offered by United States and few other governments to out, to to leave Ukraine. He nevertheless stayed, and uh, he, he uh, is generally seen now by Ukrainians as a, a very capable leader. And I can talk about uh, um, family members I have in Ukraine and friends I have in Ukraine. A lot of them did not see Zelensky as a proper leadership figure before the war, but now uh, they're all uh, very very uh, happy with his performance and uh, they're fully supportive of him and uh, uh, this is certainly something that was not the case before the war. If I could add, you know, we should not be so much hunched up uh, on the fact that uh, Zelensky was an actor uh, because it's part and parcel of the Russian propaganda to discredit the Ukrainian leader to say that he's not a real reader and that he is a drug addict and this is the, gover the government of drug addicts and, and, and uh, neo-fascists, yeah, which is the line Putin uh, took in week two, if I guess, uh, on it. On the other hand, you could say, well, all leaders to be uh, effective leaders uh, and uh, to uh, project uh, uh, the, the, the visions, uh, they have to be actors, they have to have charisma. Yeah? That's how it works. And uh, if you want to compare it, on, just think about Ronald Reagan. He was an, act, an actor before he became a politician, that's why he was so effective. Uh, think about nowadays uh, uh, about Schwarzenegger. Yeah? He was uh, a, a pop icon and then an actor and then he became governor of uh, uh, California. So I, 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 I would say, well, uh, politicians get prepared in many ways in order to become good and effective politicians. And he has uh, turned out, everyone was saying that he's just an actor, he, he's not a real president. Now we have the ultimate test. There is war going on and he turns out to be effective uh, uh, leader uh, and in such an extreme situation and, and uniquely probably in uh, modern history during the first uh, month of the war he got to speak uh, to parliaments uh, of many important countries all around the world uh, including the United States, Japan, Italy uh, and uh, so on. 
so I would say that yes, obviously there is, there is propaganda uh, in uh, the Ukrainian mass media nowadays, which are mass media under the uh, un under under attack because the entire country is under attack. But uh, if you compare if I may say so heuristically, the amount, the percentage uh, of propaganda to the percentage of facts, the percentage of uh, facts e in the mass media, Ukrainian mass media messages is much bigger uh, than what you are uh, getting uh, in uh, the Russian mass media, where basically uh, propaganda fantasies and lies upon lies is over 90%. So I, I didn't, but just just to add, add on to that, I didn't want to equate the two. There is no, you, you shouldn't do that. We, we call both propaganda, but I think in Zelensky's case, from this is my personal opinion, he uses a legitimate way to get to his own people for a good cause, whilst on the other side, it's, it's used for a terrible cause, which is which is destruction and destroying another country. So that you, we should not in any way equate it. It's just um, it's. it's important to keep in mind that politicians do acting, every single politician, to a certain degree is an actor because they need to get that message across and Zelensky is an incredibly effective one at that. So maybe jumping forward a bit, I think um, a large part of this conflict at the moment is focusing on the peace talks that are taking place and the capacity of these talks to actually achieve peace. Um, Broad question to start with: Is are these peace talks likely to be successful? I doubt. These peace talks are not peace talks. Uh, from the R Russian perspective, it is just another instrument of furthering uh, the war and actually uh, delaying the war. So the Russian troops, uh, which have logistic lines non-existent, could be provided with these logistic lines, regroup and start uh, attacking. Uh, again and we have uh, these cases of such peace talks uh, in the past in the history of modern uh, Russia under Putin that these peace, peace talks were just a cover uh, for preparing just uh, another attack and obviously I believe Zelensky uh, is playing the game to show to his people and to grasp uh, whatever uh, uh, chance it is to establish peace so that uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, cease to be killed in this, by indiscriminate uh, bombing uh, by uh, the Russian troops. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, uh, my, uh, I agree with that. I don't see these talks. Um, I don't see these talks going anywhere. Other members of the panel will know more about this than I, but it's my understanding that the the people that Putin has sort of appointed to his delegation to the delegation of these peace talks are not don't seem to be empowered to make decisions are not frontline politicians and they seem to be some of the most extreme sort of Russian nationalists in Putin's orbit. Now one of the issues is about Ukraine's neutrality and future membership of NATO and the European Union NATO was relatively NATO was a relatively easy problem to solve because there was never um, a massive groundswell of support within the alliance for Ukrainian or Georgian membership. They were only given membership action plans as sort of step by step guide to becoming NATO members under pressure from the George W. Bush administration in the waning days of 2008 and. German and French political elites have never been keen on the alliance being pushed that close um, to Russia's borders. But there are there are territorial issues that I think would be extremely difficult to settle. I can't see a scenario where Putin agrees to a peace agreement that doesn't recognise Russian sovereignty over Crimea, and probably I can't see one that doesn't involve recognising. Russian sovereignty over Donetsk and Luhansk. I don't see how um, President Zelensky could sell that to the Ukrainian people. There is he's been he's made mention of the fact that any peace deal would have to be put put to a referendum. And lastly, and this is this is more within my sort of area of expertise, 
there seems to be discussion of Ukraine being disarmed and having an army of no more than 50,000 50, troops. Essentially, given the geography involved, that having an army of 50,000 is essentially the same thing as having Ukraine functionally disarmed, functionally unable to defend even a revised set of borders. So I can't see any scenario where any Ukrainian government could, poss could possibly agree to that because that is not a compromise peace. That is, that, is a, that is basically a surrender by Ukraine to, to Russia. Um, and the last point I would make is there seems to be some discussion about whether you could separate Ukraine's membership from NATO from Ukraine's membership of the European Union and whether you could sort of Ukraine as a neutral state could join the European Union. What's important to bear in mind is neutrality doesn't really work in the context of being an EU member anymore. It's important to remember that Sweden, that Sweden, Finland, Austria did not join the European Union until after the Cold War. And increasingly, the EU is developing a common foreign policy and a common defense identity. So from a Russian point of view, I don't see how you can negotiate neutrality with Ukraine inside the EU. It wouldn't be genuine neutrality as we've understood it during the Cold War. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so... <laughs> I think if we open up now for questions from the floor, um, I think I'll take about three questions and then we'll come back to the panel and, and people can just give answers to kind of where they see necessary. So are there any questions? Just raise your hand. Uh, yeah, could, could people say where they're from perhaps? Yeah, if, you'd, if, you'd, if you would be comfortable with indicating where you're from, um, just start your question there. Uh, yes, if you stand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Lewis, I'm from uh, near Glasgow, so Scotland. Uh, my question is a bit more technical and geopolitical, but um, basically it is, uh, due, to, due to the indefensible nature of the Northern European plain in Europe, which has historically been the source of much conflict, especially between Russia and Western European states, um, is Russia destined to be in conflict with Western Europe, with Ukraine as its battleground? Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask, what do you think Putin's intentions are in relation to Ukraine? Like, I mean, what is his motivation as an actor? Does he, for example, like, what, what is he motivated by sort of like more broadly like Russian imperialism or is it good for him generally? I sort of like, just sort of, sort of want to understand him as a, as a person. I was wondering what your, the panel's thoughts on that was. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, after uh, assuming that Ukraine is able to defend its uh, independence, do you see uh, the conflict between Russia and its neighbors uh, escalating? Because considering, especially, there's Belarusian and other volunteer units in the Ukrainian military fighting on Kiev's side. Does anyone want to tackle any of those to start with? You can take the short question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's an interesting issue with Belarus because there are indeed um, possibly hundreds of uh, Belarusian uh, volunteers fighting for Ukraine and uh, there were also hundreds of them actually uh, training uh, in Ukraine before the war and. Um, Uh, when the events in uh, Belarus started in 2020, so there were a uh, large wave of uh, migrants, uh, political migrants from Belarus who uh, settled in Ukraine and uh, they were uh, potentially participating in political life in Ukraine and uh, now we see these groups actually claiming that they are now fighting for Ukraine but uh, soon they would like to go uh, to Belarus and uh, to topple uh, Lukashenko there. So. Uh, 
we don't know how Lukashenko is going to react to this situation, so it's probably something that could push him uh, forward and to make him cross this uh, red line and to get involved directly, although of course uh, Belarus is already involved in war in Ukraine, but Lukashenko did not accept it yet at the moment that he officially, at least officially, did not send his tanks and his troops into Ukraine openly yet, so that's something that uh, might happen uh, possibly in the near future, so that's uh, definitely a very interesting development. Can I just ask a quick question as a follow-up to that? If that did happen, if the Belarusian, uh, if the Lukashenko government did try to commit um, regular Belarusian troops to this fight, do you think there'd be um, a, st a strong possibility of sort of mass desertion or even a mass um, so even a mass sort of defection among Belarusian troops because I have heard that sort of muted as one of the reasons why um, you know look this, there seems to have been an understanding that Belarusia would directly join this fight it hasn't happened yet if I may on that uh, reading and uh, regularly Bel Belarusian and Belarusian language uh, independent mass media, meaning Nasza Niva and uh, the uh, comments of the office of uh, President uh, Światłana Cichanowskaya, it appears uh, that only 3%, according to some polls they've been doing, 3% of the Belarusian population are supporting the war effort at Lukashenko. So we can assume even though there is a higher percentage of, maybe a higher percentage of Lukashenko in the security forces. However, when it comes to the army, which is composed mostly from conscripts, the support for the war and Lukashenko in the, in the, in the army is similar as in society, so 3%, they, they say. Uh, so probably if they started, uh, if Lukashenko decided to attack uh, Ukraine, many troops would desert and many troops would uh, turn their guns uh, at the commanders. And we already see s uh, something of that, like uh, railway workers yeah, uh, no, were, 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 were sa sub sabotaging. Yeah, yeah, that was why I asked uh, the question, because there does seem to be sort of fairly reliable and fairly widespread reports of active uh, minor and not so minor sabotage on the, the transportation network. So just picking up on the other questions, is Russian conflict inevitable going forward? Of course not. Because if you look at history, just a bit of history, uh, R uh, Russia as Muscovy until uh, the 18th century was mostly in conflict uh, with uh, post-Mongol Khanates uh, in what today we would describe as the South or Central Asia. Then uh, Russia under Peter in Russia under Peter the Great, Russia was in conflict with the Northern powers, yeah, not Western Europe. Western Europe at that time didn't exist as a concept yet, so we have to be aware what we are asking about. But that me as a historian, I'm leaving the stage to IR specialists. At which point we come in and say regime type. And we have the idea of Kantian peace. So that might invoke the question, could Russia be different and or was Russia lost in the early Cold War period? Uh, the latter has many, many facets to it. On the whole, I would say it wasn't lost. Um, that there were enough overtures to NATO, although uh, to Russia, although certain policies were badly handled. So that would bring us back, that's a shorthand, but that would bring us back to regime type. So, a simple answer to this very good question is, is it inevitable? No, not at all. And there are other parts of Europe that have had highly conflictual relationships with each other that have been able to make historical reconciliations and in fact, very, very deep in uh, integration. You know, the, the norm in Europe was that the French and the Germans would fight each other every generation. Now we've gone several generations without that. So it's not, not inevitable, I think. 
it's a it's a tough call because there are, I think, some foundational aspects of Russian history that makes for big generalization, but some differences in values that make that Kantian perpetual peace more difficult, but certainly not impossible. And you know, our hope, our hope in the early 1990s was to push that proverbial wall of democracy and markets, but that wall of democracy and markets as far east and as fast east as possible. And to make this idea of a Vancouver, going eastwards importantly, Vancouver to Vladivostok, you know, on the Russian Pacific coast, as one contiguous common space of shared values. I don't think that was hypothetical. I don't think that was completely outlandish. So uh, to, to me, I think, it to this good question, a definitive no, it's not inevitable. So then picking up on the idea of regime, Putin's clearly incredibly influential in this. So does anyone have any insight to him as a character, his motivations, particularly given how long he's been in power? Well, no one here is from the inner circle of Putin, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know. Uh, but uh, looking at uh, his actions and decisions, I guess, uh, uh, around uh, the end uh, of the Chechen war and especially after his speech uh, decry decrying the end of the Soviet Union as the greatest uh, geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, he decided that uh, Russia should be uh, an empire, that uh, it is the only mm, goal which Russia should follow, not uh, to become, quote unquote, as many Western uh, scholars and advisors were thinking that Russia would become a normal European country. Putin didn't want it, and probably many members of the Russian elite didn't want it, and he galvanized these uh, uh, elites, and they kind of uh, embark uh, on this uh, neo-imperial uh, exercise, uh, which uh, they started uh, kind of flashing out, especially uh, after uh, establishing uh, this foundation and this ideology of the Ruski Mir, the Russian word slash uh, Pax Rosica, and uh, the war in uh, uh, Georgia, and the other wars, which you know well uh, uh, enough. Yeah? And uh, I, I would say uh, it is this project as an empire it's not in, in itself inimical uh, to, to, to European peace, uh, but uh, he kind of, uh, uh, this, this imperial project could go various directions, north, south, uh, east, but he decided to go west, uh, to go against Europe and just to trash uh, all the uh, standards, bases and norms uh, of the uh, post-war uh, peace uh, architecture, especially the uh, Helsinki final agreement? I mean, I don't know, I don't claim any uh, knowledge about how Vladimir Putin's mind works, but one thing that does, ge one thing that does genuinely frighten me is the extent to which Putin seems to be cut off from uh, seems to be cut off and deliberately isolating himself from the outside world. You know, we've all sort of we've all sort of seen the memes of you know the massive tables and everything. And yeah, but I worry in the I genuinely worry in the context of a conflict. Who is there that, that is capable of bringing Vladimir Putin bad news? And who is there that is capable of standing up to? Vladimir Putin and saying, you know, Mr. President, you're wrong. Uh, because we haven't seen Sergei Shoigu, for example, the Minister, the minister of Defence, in several days. We haven't seen uh, Valery Gerasimov, the Chief of the General Staff, for quite, for quite some time. Although that doesn't surprise me, he's not a particularly public, um, he's not a particularly public figure. Um, so I do, I do worry, it's sort of one of the perennial concerns of dictatorships and sort of closed uh, political systems is who is there to bring the, the guy at the top bad news. The other thing, the other thing 
But the other thing I would say is, you've got to bear in mind Putin's professional background as a lieutenant colonel in the KGB. And this operation, this invasion of Ukraine has all the hallmarks of a, a military operation designed by amateurs not designed by professional soldiers and it seems to have fetishized secrecy now secrecy is important in any military operation you want to keep your intentions secret from your potential adversaries but it seems that large portions of the russian army weren't aware that they were going to invade ukraine and there's there's very, there's been very good reporting that part of the that a great deal of the logistical problems that the Russian army is suffering at the moment are stemmed from the fact that troops genuinely thought they were going on exercise. And so they, you know, they sort of packed the ammunition, the food, the fuel, <coughs> the other equipment necessary for that task, for sustaining an exercise. Part of the reason they're running short is they simply weren't equipped to fight a war in the first place. Now that smacks to me, that says to me that this was an operation that Vladimir Putin had a very personal hand in designing. That that kind of uber compartmentalization of information is very typical, or was very typical of the KGB as an organizer as an organization. And I I am cons I'm, I'm genuinely concerned that there aren't people, there are no longer people around Vladimir Putin who can tell him the truth. Do we have some more questions? Fantastic. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Richard from the United States. Um, my question is, I'm sure all of us have uh, heard a lot of hypothetical scenarios of how this war develops or how it possibly ends. What are some of the key indicators, events or things that we would see that would let us know that we're heading in one direction or another? Hey, oh, can I ask two quick questions? <coughs> is that loud? That's loud, okay. Um, so how does like the involvement of like Wagner groups and mercenaries, how effective have they been? How does that change the conflict or conflict like this? And also how does the different sort of ethnic and linguistic backgrounds of places in the Baltics, also more like Poland, Hungary, change the likelihood of Putin going for war? They like, actually be able to justify it? And how could that change a type of conflict like that if Putin was to try and get involved, something like that? Sure. One more question. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Ewan. I'm from Scotland. By the way. Um, so obviously, this has been one of the biggest wars we've had since the rise of the internet, and I think we've seen the internet be used a lot in this war as a sort of weapon. So talking about deep fakes and you know propaganda and sort of misinformation. And I'm wondering if we compare this current war that's happening to maybe historical wars like World War One or World War Two. Um, how is the internet going to sort of change the direction of this war, and is it going to maybe affect the outcome and actually what we see happening? at the end of this war. Okay, if I can just pick up on Ewan and Richard's, and Richard's question. Um, the, the short but I think honest answer to your question Ewan is we have absolutely no idea at this point. Um, this is a conflict that, uh, that, is obvi that is obviously still playing out. I think the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government has been very good at, man at managing and managing information so far. I think there's, there's some evidence to say that sort of public attention is starting to, to move on to other things, but I, I'm sorry to give you a slightly useless answer, but the honest answer is I don't think we have any uh, earthly clue. If anybody else on the panel wants to contradict that. Um, okay, so moving on to Richard's question about sort of how do we sort of know how this war is progressing? I think at the mo I think at the moment we have I think at the moment what you have is a classic um, stalemate. The, the the Russian advance is what what's culminated, and what that mean what that means 
what culmination means in military terms is that the Russian units that are furthest advanced have suffered such heavy casualties in the range of sort of tw in the range of sort of twenty percent casualties that they can no longer move forward. They are no longer effective as an offensive fighting force. They can still defend their ground, they can still hold their positions, but they're no longer in a position to be able to advance because they've lost too many men through death, wounds or prisons. But more importantly they've lost too, more importantly they've lost too much equipment. And we've all seen the you know the pictures of Ukrainian farmers pulling away equipment and we've all seen sort of the enormous and quite large amount of equipment that's been abandoned. So from the Russian point of view, what they need to do now is rearrange their units in Ukraine so that the units that are following on that are further back can move up to the front line and can then resume offensive action. They also desperately need to reinforce the army that's in Ukraine. 190,000 soldiers is not a large enough force to be able to do what the Russians are trying to do, which is advance in Ukraine on several fronts. Again, I go back to what I said at the beginning of this um, debate. This was not an invasion. This was a plan to occupy Ukraine. The Russians have been genuinely, I think, surprised by the, both the ferocity of Ukrainian resistance and the, profe and the military professionalism of it as well. So if Vladimir Putin doesn't want to end this war with a compromise peace, he needs to massively reinforce the army that's in Ukraine. So one of the things we could see is mobilization of reservists. Now I'll let other people on the panel that have more knowledge of Russian society talk about the possible social and political implications of that. <clears throat> but I don't see how, from a military point of view, Russia sustains this campaign for very long without mobilization of reservists. From a Ukrainian point of view, you've managed to stop the initial Russian advance. And if this were World War II, or the Arab-Israeli conflicts that have taken place since 1945, this would be the classic moment to launch a massive counter-attack with armoured reserves that you'd manage to hold back from the initial engagement. The problem is, from a Ukrainian point of view, they've committed their entire armed forces in order to stop the Russian advance. There really is no ready reserve um, capable of mounting large-scale countrywide offensives. We have seen quite successful local offensives around Kiev and around Mikolaev, but they are local in scale and they're not much larger than a single brigade. So we're talking about seven to 10,000 troops max and often much smaller than that. Um, so I fear two things. Firstly, I fear that Vladimir Putin is committed enough to this war that he is going to have to mobilize the reserves of the Russian army. The second thing I genuinely do worry about is use of chemical weapons. I don't think there is much chance of the use of nuclear weapons, even on a very small scale, and I certainly don't think there's much chance of use, the use of biological weapons, because in both of those categories of weapon of mass destruction, the probability of a NATO reaction is too great, and the possibility of Russian troops suffering bully and even the Russian civil population suffering equally from the use of those weapons is too high. But from a tactical point of view, leaving aside moral considerations, the Ukrainian defences are stretched really thin, as I said a moment ago. So if I'm a Russian, if I'm Valery Gerasimov, I'm thinking that my best way of winning this conflict in relatively short order is to try and break the Ukrainian defence in depth. And it doesn't particularly matter where I do that, because my goal is to try and sow panic, is to try and break through this relatively linear, i.e. sort of a straight line, stacked up, quite conventional defence. If I can do that, if I can break through in breadth and depth somewhere, I might be able to panic the Ukrainian army into a precipitate retreat and turn this from a war of attrition into a war of movement. 
And in a war of movement, the fact that Russia has superior firepower in terms of tanks, artillery and aircraft is going to be able to play more of a role. So I do worry that the Russians are going to resort to chemical weapons. Now, I've not seen much evidence of Russian soldiers carrying the kind of protective equipment you would need to operate in that environment. So, unfortunately, you would be looking at a variety of chemical weapons that are fast acting and quick dispersing, which means probably nerve agent, which means VX or sarin. Um, these are weapons that were deployed in Syria. Now, the Russian army, in order to, for them to be effective, would have to deploy them on a much larger scale than they've been used in Syria. The comparison I would make is the Iran-Iraq war between 1980 and 1989. And use of nerve agent in that conflict killed tens of thousands of people. Um, so yeah, that, that is something I worry about. And I do, I, I'm glad to see the statement from President Biden today that, that the use of chemical weapons would provoke some NATO reaction, although I think he was rightly careful not to specify what that was. Uh, so just, I think, um, Morgan's questions about mercenaries and then also the linguistic ethnic backgrounds and the way that that influences the progression of this kind of conflict towards the future are really interesting. So I wondered if anyone had any thoughts. I can talk about the mercenaries. Yeah. So there were certainly reports of uh, this Wagner company mercenaries being deployed uh, uh, near Kiev, and now it's called actually Liga, it's not called Wagner anymore in Russia. Uh, but uh, they have not been particularly efficient so far because we have to keep in mind that these people are light infantry and they, they train, they used to fight counterinsurgencies. That's what they've done in Syria, in Libya, in Central African Republic, and they would not be particularly efficient in this conventional type of war that Russia is fighting in Ukraine so and Ukrainians are actually quite uh, quite good at intercepting phone calls of uh, Russian so soldiers that uh, Russian soldiers uh, call uh, their families back home and uh, there were quite a few intercepts where members of this Wagner group actually uh, complained to their families back home that this is nothing like Syria or this is nothing like Libya and uh, they, they were in a relatively desperate uh, situation as compared to their previous deployments. Dr. Yeah, well, I mean, if it comes to this kind of uh, language of politics being used uh, uh, within the scope of uh, the Ruski Mir, the Russian word slash Russian peace uh, uh, ideology is uh, kind of imperial, so it is not, n not consistent. The, it is being employed in such a way and projected in such a way uh, to justify, quote unquote, uh, to use the old uh, uh, Russian imperial term, the gathering of the lands of the Russian Empire. Yeah? So you have this uh, middle 19th century theory developed in line with this uh, Uvarov's 1833 slogan of autocracy, uh, orthodoxy, and nationality that uh, all the uh, Slavophone Orthodox Christians are actually Russians. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, from the linguistic, uh, po from the point of view of language politics, it got underpinned uh, in the middle of the 19th century with this theory that the Russian language consists. Uh, from three uh, from three dialects, uh, from the White Russian Belarusian dialect, from the Little Russian quote, uh, slash Ukrainian dialect, and from the Great Russian dialect, which is the true Russian language, and that the Belarusian dialect and Ukrainian dialect should die out. And in the, theory, in the territories which already got occupied or which got occupied uh, in uh, Ukraine by Russia, Ukrainian was phased out as the language of education and Russian introduced, for instance. When it comes uh, to other uh, former uh, provinces of the Russian Empire, like uh, uh, Eastern Poland, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 
uh, they are deploying uh, the theory that all the Slavs are actually uh, part and parcel of the great Slavic nation, which is uh, which is uh, uh, actually the Russian nation. Yeah? So we are going back to this Pan-Slav ideology, which was used, uh, adopted by uh, uh, the Russian Empire, especially in the late 19th century, uh, when other languages uh, uh, in the function of uh, languages of administration and education were phased out uh, across the width and breadth of the uh, Russian uh, Empire. Obviously, that's uh, leaving uh, us from our Western perspective, with the difficult, uh, uh, with the difficult uh, uh, nut to crack, meaning the uh, Baltic-speaking and Finno-Ugric-speaking uh, former Russian provinces of Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Estonia, or Finland. These are small peanuts, yeah. So let's grab them anyway. They are half Slav anyway. That's how it uh, looks like from the Russian perspective, unfortunately. Did you want to add something? Was it, sorry, just to clarify, was there a question on that, on, on Poland and Hungary as well? Because then we went on... The yeah, I also added uh, Poland and Hungary because they're, well, mostly just because it's, you're not really sure how far Russia might want to go, or Putin might want to go, and like how different those countries have very different histories, I yes. think, even more clearly distinct. How does that sort of change the way in which Putin can go to them? I guess that would be like, don't be the past thing. I, I think, it, I, I don't know as much about Poland as, as other members of the panel, but being Hungarian on, on, on that, uh, on that note, um, Hungary is completely different from any other country in the region or basically anywhere else, which is always a huge political issue. Um, but but it, it is hard to see how any further incursion anywhere could, could be justified, even, even in Russia. What I'm worried about a lot more is, is the reaction of these countries to what is going on. And something that we didn't touch upon is energy security. Because of course these countries, much of their natural oil and gas is coming from Russia and still coming from Russia and it's really hard to see how that can be changed. Um, so a, a bigger discussion is going on in, in, in the West as in, as in how to kind of reduce um, this reliance on Russian oil and gas. But unless big countries step in at this point and help the smaller ones and, and Hungary and in Pol Poland is not a small country but in terms of you know, if you compare it to Germany and how fast Germany can change its source of um, energy, it, it, it will have um, a harder time. It's, it's really hard to see how to get, for example, Hungary back into the NATO fold, which had to balance this risk of, of it being a NATO member, but having all of its energy coming from the East. And, and I think this is something that we should concentrate on going forward, because it will be crucial in keeping the West and NATO together. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to follow up on that very briefly, we talk about, you know, where, is, where might Russia go next. The fact is, there is nowhere for Russia to go next. It has the vast bulk, you know, the vast bulk of its armed forces tied down in Ukraine. Even, in, and e even in the unlikely event they're able to defeat the Ukrainian government in short order, there is a very high likelihood now of a nationwide insurgency that would insurgency that would last for years. Um, and, you know, there's every possibility, you know, we, the consensus in the West a month ago was that the conventional phase of this war would be relatively brief and what the Western response would be doing would be fueling and aiding a Ukrainian insurgency. Actually, the Ukrainians are mounting a very professional conventional defence of their country. So I think this, this sort of discussion about where Russia might go next is a little bit overblown because frankly, to put it slightly glibly, you know, Putin's got his hands full as it is um, and he's likely to have his hands full for a very long time. However, the conventional conflict plays out in the end. So I think this kind of what Russia might do next discussion, there's a danger of that being a little bit overblown. I'm sort of more focused on the existential crisis at hand 
rather than looking for the next one. I'm conscious we're coming towards the end of the time and there's a lot to discuss but I just wanted to finish on talking about the kind of human aspect of like outcome of this crisis and specifically the huge number of refugees, um, <coughs> their experiences, the sustainability <coughs> the kind of current uh, mass kind of leaving of Ukraine and so I wanted to kind of ask sort of two questions. One can anyone offer any insight into what that kind of refugee um, experience is like or kind of what the kind of journey is like and then secondly and probably kind of more importantly what can we do to help um, and what can be done to kind of help what looks like will be a very long lasting crisis can I start with the second question mm -hmm. We, if we assume we is the Western NATO, we could help Ukraine win, so the refugees could return. How to do it? I don't know. I leave it to strategists. Maybe a more narrower we, as in we in St Andrews, we kind of students, we professors. We as students and uh, as the community at St Andrews uh, could help by accepting uh, here and helping uh, uh, Ukrainian students who are unable now to study. Uh, we could uh, accept and help to do research uh, for UK, uh, Ukrainian researchers who had uh, to uh, flee. That, 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 that would be the easiest and uh, most straightforward uh, uh, way for us uh, to act as a university and help in the university way. Obviously, we uh, could uh, gather some money and channel it uh, to the accounts uh, of the Ukrainian army so they could buy uh, more arms. And we as uh, individuals already using this uh, scheme rolled out by Scotland and by the British government uh, uh, in our families uh, could make space for accepting uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, who are already 3 million and counting. Unless anyone has anything to add, I think. I mean, I slightly wonder, for, forgive the presumptuousness, if there are suggestions from the floor on this as well. If, if this is a question about activism. <coughs> well, um, I have a very blunt suggestion, which is that there is a donation box in the <laughs> back. Um, all the money that's donated there will either go to United Help Ukraine, which is a Ukrainian charity providing humanitarian aid, or it will go, uh, the other half of the money will go to Come Back Alive, which is a charity working with the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, particularly providing non-lethal assistance, things like <coughs> medical training. Um, this money will really, really help. Uh, but also what you could do is, uh, in a, a very direct sense, uh, I, um, there is next Wednesday, the AU is looking to collect money from people attending the varsity thing. So if anybody would actually like to come out with a donation box and get some money, please see me after the event. I'd be very grateful for any support. That was very philosophical, I'm sorry. <laughs> Probably the most useful thing anybody said. So. <laughs> we have uh, another suggestion. Um, yeah, this is perhaps less practical and more of something that's theoretical and, and a bit more meta. But I think a key way that we can help is just really, really centering Ukrainian voices. Because that's something that I have found a lot um, in coverage, both academic and also from journalists, is that there's actually very little coverage from within Ukraine and very little centering of Ukrainian voices. You have panels and conferences where there's not a single person from Eastern Europe or even from Ukraine. Um, and I think that's something we really need to tackle. And another thing that we really need to tackle within academic spaces, within universities and establishments is decolonizing Eastern Europe and changing our perception of Russia um, and decolonizing Russia because at the moment we are, we, most people probably didn't even know where Ukraine was on a map until recently, right? 
and most people don't really understand Eastern Europe, they don't really understand Ukraine and I think that was actually a huge issue even with um, NATO and military strategists in the West but the fact that they weren't listening to people in the Baltics, people in Eastern Europe. There was a certain element of, dare I say, Western arrogance and kind of west planning towards how, and you still see it to this day, how Ukraine and Eastern European countries should respond to Russia, rather than actually listening to what those countries have to say. So yeah, my suggestion is perhaps not as practical, but I think this is something that we can continue to develop in the future. If I may on that, it, it is a very good suggestion, you know. Uh, we should start reading Ukrainian language newspapers. Yeah, uh, obviously you say how to do it. You know, probably we as the university should offer uh, a lectureship uh, in the Ukrainian in Ukrainian language and culture. Otherwise, uh, if you don't know Ukrainian, you can use Google Translate uh, to read uh, uh, in uh, Ukrainian. So there are ways uh, of uh, doing it, but. Uh, I would say I've been teaching here for 12 years uh, and uh, I was offering in the School of History a module on the history of uh, early modern uh, history of Central Europe and modern uh, history of Central Europe. And, and this module got scrapped. Basically students were not interested. Why? Because they wanted either Germany, German history or Russian history. And I was saying there are 200 million people living in different kinds of countries between Germany and Russia. They were not interested. Yeah. So that's how much our students are de facto interested uh, in non-Western or not non-fully Western history, even if this history is in Europe, so probably this feeds back to this proposition that uh, our mindset should um, get more decolonized, if I may say so. so. Just very quickly on that, I I think the fact that we are here today and having this discussion is, is also important, and it might not seem as so now, but if we can keep up you know, the enthusiasm for, for understanding the war and, and, and supporting Ukraine, that will, that will help in the long term. Um, I have family in, in Ukraine and they always say, well, you know, the messages that we are getting even from strangers on Facebook, you know, matter to us a lot, exactly because they, they feel the support. So not forgetting that, that they are there, they are mounting, a, you know, an, an enormous resistance against oppression and supporting them in any way we can, either by, by donating or doing whatever we can do, is I think incredibly important. And remembering that this will go on for some time and keeping it up is I think what the challenge will be and I think that's where we can, we can play our part, even if it's, if it's small. Great. I think on that note and given the time, we're going to have to end here. Um, I think if you want to approach any of the panellists afterwards and ask a question, I'm sure, I mean I'm putting them on the spot, but I'm sure that they would be willing to answer anything. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to I'm gonna have to leave to catch my bus. But if anybody does have any questions, my email address is LFM6, um, and I'd be, ha I'd, be happy to I'd be happy to correspond. I'd be happy to correspond by email. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say a final huge thank you to all of the panellists for coming here. Um, it's been fascinating hearing the diverse opinions <coughs> about what's happening and I think that hopefully everyone's left this more informed than they were in, when they went in. So if people would like to join me in saying thank you. Then. And thanks to you for convening this. Yes, thank you. Oh, no.